to drift with every passion till my soul is a stringed lute on which all winds can play. Is it for this that I have given away mine ancient wisdom and austere control? Methinks my life is a twice written scroll scrawled over on some boyish holiday with idle song for pipe and virale which do but mar the secret of the whole. Surely there was a time I might have trod the sunlit height and from life's dissonance struck one clear chord to reach the ears of God. Is that time dead? Lo, with a little rod I did but touch the honey of romance, and must I lose the soul's inheritance? For a long time before that poem had appeared in print, its author's name was providing the English public with a topic for conversation very far removed indeed from its normal themes, at once so classic and so cozy, of the weather and the royal family. There goes that bloody fool Oscar Wilde, a gentleman in the street had audibly remarked as he passed the poet by, and the poet turned to his companion and said, it's quite extraordinary how quickly one becomes known in London. His own appearance in these youthful London days was indeed very spectacular. We can picture the tall, amply built young man with that very powerful, indolent, Babylonian sort of a face he had with his drooping crown of long, dim hair into which at some moment of depression, possibly, the iron had entered. Often he would be wearing knee breeches, silk stockings, a velveteen jacket, a floating tie of greenish brocaded satin, and in his pale pointed hand, he would hold a lily, sometimes even a sunflower. Well, he was bound to attract attention. He was bound to be talked about. And that, of course, gave him exquisite pleasure. It was precisely what he had decided he wanted, to be talked about everywhere in the world, everywhere. Well, Dublin, no doubt, would have talked about him, too. His own native Dublin had indeed already talked about him. He'd seen to that. But in Dublin then, as now, talk was mainly for talk's sake. There would have been no result of the talk at all, you know, no rich reward, no worldwide fame, no jeweled elegance, and those dinner tables he so rightly felt he was destined to dominate would have been in Dublin far less opulent than those in London and far more conversationally competitive. Oh, yes, a very charming, rather busy sort of English lady once gently remonstrating with the poet about his fate in a fortune teller. Had said, fortune telling is too wild, fortune telling. Oh, dear me, but don't you feel in your heart, I mean, that, you know, that fortune-telling and all that sort of thing is rather tempting providence? And the poet had answered, but dear lady, surely providence can resist temptation by this time. Now, who in his own island would have ever listened to a crack like that without trying either to cap or to capsize it? Oh, no, no, no. England was clearly the place for him, and to England he went. And having emerged from Oxford encrusted with honors, he proceeded to London, where he found plenty of time to amuse himself and the town prodigiously, to lecture about art, to be invited to nearly all the great London houses, frequently more than once, and also to write a quantity of verse. He found time in London, too, to fall in love, to fall in love desperately with the beautiful Lily Langtry, the glorious, the notorious Mrs. Lily Langtry. Jersey Lily, as she was often called, and two of the poems he dedicated to her charming. One of them ends with these verses. Oh, well, if my heart must break, dear love, for your sake, it will break in music, I know. Poet's heart breaks so. Oh. But strange that I was not told the brain could hold in one tiny ivory cell God's heaven and hell. Was it hope that hit that last verse? I often wonder. However, he did recover, one must say, with remarkable rapidity from the heart that Lily Langtry had broken, and he journeyed most cheerfully to America to lecture there on art and aesthetics. Now, he was at this time 28 years of age, and having expressed a faint disapproval of the Atlantic Ocean, Disappointing, was it that? The Atlantic is not nearly as majestic or even quite as large as I had expected. 
and having so told some New York customs official on arrival, he had nothing at all to declare except his genius. Having said these pretty, modest things, he proceeded to give to his American public everything in the world he felt they might expect from him, and probably he gave them a little bit more too. Now, here are some of his own impressions of the more remote parts of Colorado in the early 1880s. While I was lecturing at Denver, Wild writes, I received a message to say that if I went on to Leadville, as I proposed to do, the harsher spirits in that wild mining town would be sure to shoot me or my traveling manager. I at once wrote and told them that nothing they could possibly do to my traveling manager would intimidate me, and I went. It was a gloomy, jolting journey on a gloomy, wet day, 150 miles through the Rocky Mountains, and when I arrived at last at a cheerless, snow-covered station, at my lecture on that very first night while thinking is, there was a baby present in the audience, a baby. And when I said, there is no more beautiful way of appreciating nature than through art, the baby burst into tears. I said, I do wish the youthful enthusiast there would restrain its raptures and never become as silent again. Now, the rest of my audience, while it continues, was composed chiefly of miners, silver miners, with huge hats, scarlet shirts, and high top boots, rather reminded me of 17th century cavaliers. Indeed, they were the only really well-dressed men I'd seen since arriving in the United States. And there they sat. Rows and rows of them, enormous, powerfully built fellows, silent as the grave, their eyes watchful, their brawny arms folded over their muscular chests, a loaded gun on each swelling thigh. I spoke to these delightful fellows about the earlier Florentine schools of painting. And they slept. They slept as peacefully as if no crime had ever stained the ravines of their wild mountain home. I described to them the pictures of Botticelli, and the very name, I dare say, sounded to them like some newly invented drink. Anyway, it did arouse them from their dreams. So I then read to them certain chapters of the autobiography of that great Florentine genius and adventurer, Benvenuto Cellini. And he delighted them all so much that they demanded as one man why the hell I hadn't brought him with me. Well, I explained, of course, I had to explain that and Benito Cellini had been dead for quite a while. And this elicited the immediate question, who shot him? Well, when my lecture was over while it continues, they invited me to supper. And having accepted that invitation, I had to go down the mine in a rickety bucket in which it was utterly impossible even for me to be graceful. At the bottom of the mine, we sat down to the banquet, the first course of which was whiskey, the second course whiskey, and the third course whiskey. The delight of those miners on discovering that art and appetite could and did go hand in hand knew no bounds. When I lit a long black cigar and quaffed a couple of fiery cocktails without flinching, they cheered me until the silver fell down in glittering dust from the roof onto our table. And incidentally, do you know, after a while they say, drank those rough fellows under that very table on that very night. No? Yes, and many other rough people under many other tables on many other rough nights, too. In fact, he had a marvelous time all over the States. And when he got back to London, he fell in love all over again, and this time he married her. He married a gentle and very beautiful young Irish girl called Constance Mary Lloyd. Now, they were passionately and mutually in love, rapturously happy together, and at the same time in his life it was the boy was making his first experiments in the art of the dramatist. Now, his first two plays, I'm sorry to have to tell you, were what today we should call flops, just flops, you know. However, quite soon he'd presented the world with a resounding success, a comedy entitled Lady Windermere's Fan, and this it was that set the first seal of a really wide popularity on his already considerable literary reputation, and that earned for him, too, the cachet for modernity. In fact, he was regarded by his contemporaries as representing the very quintessence of everything that was most ultra-modern in life and in letters. And to my mind, the true modern, the essential modern, who also happens to be a man of genius, doesn't merely echo the age he lived in, he invents it. I'm quite serious. Oscar Wilde, I suggest, was largely responsible for the invention of the period we talk about today as the 1890s through the first half of which remarkable decade he strutted, and through the second half of which he staggered. The 
strutting phase in his life when he was dandy of dress, of manners, of speech, of wit and intellect even, of ideas. The period of night during which he invented that curious dyed flower, forever associated with his name, the green carnation. This period, I think, has a very characteristic moment in a little scene from his comedy, An Ideal Husband, a scene which opens with Lord Goring between two very smart London parties, talking to his manservant, Phipps, about the subtle influence of the buttonhole upon thought. Now, Phipps, the manservant, believe me or not, is standing about here. Well, you, I hope you'll see him in a minute or two. And Lord Goring enters his drawing room with a rather faded flower in his coat, which he wants to change and see for a second party. And seeing his manservant there, he says, Phipps, Oh, Phipps, have you got that second buttonhole for me? Yes, my lord. Oh, do you show it me? Ah, mm, rather a distinguished thing, Phipps. Of course, you realize, I suppose, that I'm the only person of the smallest importance in London at present who wears a buttonhole. Yes, my lord, I had observed that. You see, Phipps, fashion is what one wears oneself. What is unfashionable is simply what other people wear. Yes, my lord, other people are dreadful, Phipps, absolutely dreadful. The only possible society, thank you, is oneself. To love oneself is the beginning of a lifelong romance, Phipps. Yes, my lord. I don't think I like this button very much. I don't like it at all. I mean, look at me in the glass. It makes me look so terribly old. I mean, it makes me look almost in the prime of life. I think for the future, you know, a more trivial buttonhole, especially for Thursday evenings. I will speak to the florist, my lord. She's had a loss in her family lately, which may account for the lack of triviality your lordship complains of in the buttonhole. Curious thing about the lower classes in England, they're always losing their relations. Yes, my lord. They are extremely fortunate in some respects. Yes. Want my cab at once? Yes, of course. Oh, and by the way, Phipps, if anybody calls, I'm not at home. You do understand, don't you? Thank you, that's very good. Uh, Phipps's views on family life seem somewhat lax. Really, if our own servants can't set us a good moral example, what on earth is the use of servants? <clears throat> Lord Cavendish, my lord. Good heavens. Now, why must one's parents always call in to see one at the wrong moment? Some ghastly mistake in nature, I suppose. Delighted to see you, my dear father. Now, of course, with the increase of his success as a playwright and indeed as a social figure in London, a curious new note could be observed in the personality of Oscar Wilde. One might say, or rather, rather fancifully if you like, that the splendid, joyous, pagan noonday of his sunflower and lily were making way for the more subtle and elaborate afternoon of the green carnation. Indeed, the green carnation by this time had come to stand almost as a symbol of the age. And it represented, I feel, a mood rather than a movement in art or letters. A mood that was at once voluptuous, bizarre, deeply colored, languorous, amoral, witty, and deliberately artificial. Some people loved it all. It's an open revolt against Victorian prudery. Other people found in the green carnation and everything it signified something faintly sinister. But whether people approved of it or not, nobody questioned for a single moment who was the high priest of the cult of the green carnation. And one of his poems, written a little before he had invented what he called that magnificent flower, nevertheless does show its many caprices in a certain strange macabre light. We loitered down the moonlit street. We caught the tread of dancing feet and stopped beneath the harlot's house. Inside, above the din and fray, we heard the loud musicians play the toy as leave as hearts of Strauss. Like strange mechanical grotesques making fantastic arabesques, the shadows raced across the blind. We watched the ghostly dancers spin to sound of horn and violin like black leaves wheeling in the wind. Sometimes a clockwork puppet pressed a phantom lover to her breast. Sometimes they seemed to try to sing. Sometimes a horrible marionette came out and smoked its cigarette upon the steps like a live thing. Then, turning to my life, I said, the dead are dancing with the dead. The dust is whirling with the dust. 
but she, she heard the violin and left my side and entered in. Love passed into the house of lust. Then suddenly the tune went false. The dancers wearied of the waltz. The shadows ceased to wheel and whirl. And down the long and silent street, the dawn with silver sandal feet crept like a frightened girl. The same curious mood is seen perhaps at its height in his one and only novel, a work of art which, however, earned nothing for him at all except a unanimous abuse of all the critics. For one thing, they decided together that it was unwholesome, you see. Even now, we mustn't forget for a moment that unwholesome was a very popular adjective during the 1890s. In those days, everything you didn't approve of, you said it was unwholesome, sir, and you snorted. If, on the other hand, you were the sort of person who did approve of that sort of feeling, you probably said it was deliciously, deciduously exotic. And you breathed through your nose and gazed at the ceiling, so you see people hadn't changed a bit, really. However, to the novel. The painter Basil Hallward, at work in his London studio, is putting the finishing touches to a splendid full-length portrait of a young gentleman who is 20 years of age, who is the possessor of birth, breeding, of enormous wealth, of amazing beauty, and who bears the name of Dorian Gray. The painter Basil Hallward is filled with a sort of romantic admiration for his sitter, and very much against his own better judgment, he introduces the boy one lovely afternoon in summer to an old Oxford friend of his own, a devil about town called Lord Henry Wotton. Now, Lord Henry Wotton, I may tell you, is simply Mephistophelesian Faust. That's who he is, plain as a pikestaff. And as soon as he sets eyes on young Dorian Gray, he proceeds to pour into his ears his own philosophy of life. And this is briefly that youth and beauty and pleasure, however fleeting, are the only things in the world worth a damn, and that the best way to enjoy them to the full is by draining every cup that life can offer to the very dregs. Now, Dorian, timidly, but apparently unhesitatingly, becomes a convert to this hedonistic viewpoint. So enthusiastic a convert, indeed, does he become that as soon as Hallward's picture of him is framed and finished, and he, Dorian, standing in front of the thing for the first time, realizes for the first time in his life how marvelously young and how ridiculously beautiful he is. Like some Greek god, he utters a prayer. And he prays secretly that the picture may change and grow old and bear the burden of all his days and all his deeds and that he himself may remain forever young. Oscar Wilde, you know, once said that when the gods wish to punish us, they answer our prayers. And this, of course, is the fate of Dorian Gray. His prayer is answered the miracle happens in the picture. The picture does begin to change suddenly, rather horribly. Gradually it changes. And Dorian Gray, fascinated by the horror that is creeping slowly across the painted canvas, has the thing stored away in an attic at the top of his house in Grosvenor Square in London, an attic to which he alone has the key. And then, largely under the influence of a fascinating but wicked book, French, of course, given to him at the right moment by Lord Henry Wotton, of course. Chiefly under this evil influence, Dorian Gray begins to lead a life of the most reprehensible, though on the whole, unspecified pleasures. He burns, indeed, continually with the spirit of pleasure, passing from one strange, erotic vice to another. And yet, in spite of the passing of many, many years and of the really dreadful life that he's leading, Dorian Gray goes on looking like some blameless 19-year-old Narcissus. The same, alas, cannot be said about the picture, which all alone in its locked-up attic, with an occasional visit from Dorian himself to see how it's getting on. The picture goes from beautiful to bad, and from bad to worse. It gets older and older, more and more vicious-looking, more and more depraved, horrible, luxurious, sensual, seared and lined with hideous passions, and in fact altogether horrifying. Well, 
19 baroque years go by in this fashion, and the innocent cause of all this terrible trouble, poor old Basil Holwood, who, as you may remember, did paint the fatal portrait and who incidentally has no idea of its whereabouts. Basil Holwood is perturbed at the evil reputation that by this time inevitably has grown up about the name of his friend Dorian Gray. So perturbed indeed is Basil Holwood that one foggy night in November, he calls on his friend in Grosvenor Square and says to him, Dorian, for God's sake, Dorian, I beg that you'll tell me, is there, I mean, is there any truth at all in these, oh, these hideous rumors that are circulating about you everywhere? Dorian Gray is furious, says Holwood, about this interview. He considers it an impertinent and vulgar piece of cross-examination. And suddenly, to his good friend, Basil Horvath, he says, very well, Basil, very well, very well. As you seem so extraordinarily anxious to know all about my life and to probe into the secrets of my very soul. <laughs> I suppose, really, you should know everything. The truth, yes, you might as well come upstairs with me. I keep a diary of my life, you see, from day to day, and it never leaves the room in which I write it. Never come with me, Basil. You, you've prated long enough tonight about corruption. Well, now you can look at corruption. You can look at it face to face. And he takes up a lamp and guides the bewildered Hallward up the stairs. And as he's unlocking the now heavily barred door of the secret attic, he turns once more to his friend and says, yes. As a matter of fact, Basil, you of all men in the world have a perfect right to know everything about me, everything. You've had far more influence over my life than you seem to imagine. So come in and look at your handiwork. The two men pass into the attic together, and Hallward sees to his utter bewilderment that he's in his own poorly furnished room, dim with dust and cobwebs, and hanging there on the wall, there's a full-length portrait of a stooping elderly man with a face and the eyes and the mouth of a satyr. Gradually, of course, the truth dawns upon him. It is indeed the portrait of Dorian Gray, which he himself had painted nearly 20 years ago. And filled with disgust, with horror, he turns furiously on the golden-haired young Apollo, who stands smiling by his side and says, my God! This is true, if it can be true, and this is what you're doing with your life. The quarrel between the two friends grows up like a flame, and quite suddenly, Dorian Gray, in an access of ungovernable rage and loathing of this man he feels has ruined his life, snatches up a knife, and rushing suddenly upon Hallward from behind, where he sat at the table, Dorian Gray dug the knife into the great vein that is behind the ear, crushing the man's head down on the table and stabbing him again and again and again. A son of somebody choking with blood. Dorian Gray stabbed him twice more in the neck. Now there was no, no sound. No sound and no movement. He was dead. And yet, had it not been for that red, jagged rent at the back of his neck and the black clotted pool that was slowly brimming over the table's edge, one might have thought he was simply asleep. Basil Hallward. Oh, well. He was nothing now but a dreadful white wax image stained with blood. His eye fell upon the portrait. Portrait. What was that crimson dew that spotted the right hand there? It was blood oozing from the painted cap. He turned away and for some reason presently pulled out his watch. Five and twenty minutes to two, and Dorian Gray began to think. To think. To think? Oh, well, Dorian Gray, with the aid of a scientific friend, whom he blackmails that he may help him in this work, disposes by fire of the body of Basil Holbert, the artist, and the good friend he has murdered. And then, in complete safety, for indeed his alibis were perfect, he continues to lead his evil life. But after a while, inevitably, it palls on him. Gradually, the image of utter decay and corruption at work in his soul rises like a phantom and looks at him. And then suddenly, one day, his tortured imagination is purified by a new thought of 
very simple to record a form of resolution, a dream for the future. And filled with the freshness and the beauty that this new hope in life seems to offer him, Dorian finds himself one lovely night in summer, about six months after the murder of Basil Holden, dining alone with his old friend Lord Henry Wotton in Lord Henry's house. And as dinner draws towards its close, he confides to his friend his hopes and resolutions about the future. Now, now there's no use your telling me you're going to be good, my dear Dorian, cried Lord Henry, laughing. You're quite, quite perfect as it is, my dear boy. Pray, don't check. No, no, Harry, no, you see, quite right, quite right. I've done so much evil in my life, so much, and I'm not going to do any more of it. It's all quite simple. I told you it's a form of resolution, really. No, no, Harry, please. No, listen, if you're going to laugh at me, Harry, I want to talk about something else. Please, I insist. Tell me all about yourself. What's going on in town? I haven't been to the club for ages. The club? Oh, I don't know. People are still talking about poor Basil's disappearance, you know. Basil? Basil Hogarth? Still. <laughs> I should have thought they might have grown tired of that subject by this time. My dear Dorian, they've only been talking about it for six weeks. And the British public is really not equal to the mental strain of having more than two topics every six months. They have been rather fortunate, however, lately, and, uh, and they've had my divorce case, and now, you see, there's this extraordinary disappearance of a famous artist. You see, Dorian, Scotland Yard, it seems, still insists that the tall man in the grey Ulster who left for Paris by the midnight train on November the 9th, wasn't it, was Basil. And the French police declare that Basil never arrived in France at all. I don't know, I suppose, about... Two weeks' time, we may hear he's been seen in San Francisco. It's an odd thing, but everybody who disappears nowadays is said to be seen in San Francisco, at least in the most delightful circles. It must possess all the attractions of the next world. Let's have our coffee here in the music room, Dorian. You must play it, you must play some Chopin. Yes, Chopin. I adore Chopin. The man with whom my wife ran away played Chopin ever. Dorian said nothing, but sat down at the piano. And after the coffee had been brought in, he stopped playing and looking over at his friend, he said suddenly, Harry, Harry, I wonder has it ever occurred to you that Basil might possibly have been murdered? Basil? Murdered? My dear Dorian, Basil had no enemies, though I will admit he was thoroughly disliked by all his friends. He really was rather popular, wasn't he, poor old boy? And always wore a Waterbury watch. Who on earth would murder Basil? What would you say, Harry? I wonder what you would say if I were to tell you that... that I had murdered Basil Hogarth. You? <laughs> I should simply say that you were posing for a part that didn't suit you, my dear Dorian. That's all. It isn't in you. It isn't in your nature to commit a crime. I'm perfectly sorry, of course, if I hurt your vanity by saying this, but it's true. All crime is vulgar, just as all vulgarity is crime. Of course, I know that anything in the world becomes a pleasure if one does it once too often. But even as a pleasure, murder, I should fancy, is invariably rather an escape, don't you feel so? Oh, I do. I feel that deeply. I should never do anything one can't talk about after dinner. No, let's pass and poor Basil. Why don't you play me that old new something by Chopin again? A nocturne. Yes, a nocturne. And then, as you play, Dorian, tell me in a low voice the real secret. Obviously have a secret. You really are very wonderful, Dorian, very wonderful. You look tonight exactly as you always look, the same marvelous boy that I met in Basil Howard's garden. Nearly, it was more than 20 years ago. I wish you'd tell me your secret. To get back my own youth. I think I'd do anything in the world except get up early, take exercise, or be respectable. You see, I have sorrows of my own, Dorian. You and me and nothing on earth, even you. The real tragedy of age is not the one that it is old at all, but that one is young. I'm amazed sometimes at my own sincerity. Oh, Dorian, how happy you must be. What an extra little life. I mean, you've known everything. You've drunk so deeply of everything. And yet life has never changed you. Now, you're still the same. I am not the same, Harry. My God, I'm not. I've changed. And I'm going to change more than ever. More than you'll never change towards me, my dear boy. 
You and I will always be the greatest friends. Yes, yes, we will. Yet you did poison me once with a book, Harry, long ago. I should never forgive you for that, you know, never. Harry, Harry, will you, will you please make, make one promise to me? Promise me faithfully that you'll never, never give that book to anybody else. It, it does harm to people's souls, I swear. My dear Dorian, you're actually beginning to moralize. You realize you must be more careful, dear boy, or you'll find yourself one day going about warning people against all those sins of which you happen to have grown tired. It must be charming to play the hypocrite. And as for being poisoned by a book, great book, it makes no difference. Art has no influence over action. Art annihilates all desire to act. It is superbly sterile. The books the world calls immoral are merely books to show to the world its own shame, and there we go. Going? Why, my dear fellow, so early? Oh, well. Shall we lunch tomorrow, then? Would you like that? Are you free? No, no, I'm calling for you, of course, at once. Good night, Dorian. Good night, Harry. But as Dorian Gray got to the door, he paused as though there was something he must say to his friend, and then he hesitated sighed and went out. And when he got home, he sent his servant to bed. Supposing, he thought, with this new light he was leaving, the picture had changed a little. He would go and see. He took a lamp and crept softly up the stairs. He passed swiftly into the attic, bolting and barring the heavy door behind him. It was his custom of placing the lamp on the table. He looked at the picture. No change at all, except that in the eyes, yes, it was, in the eyes, there, were, there was a new and horrifying expression of, what was it? Cunning, craftiness, yes. Yes, and on the mouth was now the curved, wrinkling smile of the hypocrite. Lord Henry had been right. There was nothing in his new resolution but hypocrisy. Nothing, nothing. The search for a new sensation. The thing was horrible still. More loathsome, if possible, than before. And that scarlet dew that spotted the right hand there was brighter than ever now. More like blood that had been newly spilt. And there was blood, too, upon the painted feet as though the thing had dripped. Blood even upon the hand that had never held the knife. Oh, God, what does it all mean? Could it mean that he was meant to confess, to give himself up to the police, to confess to the murder of Basil Holbert, to atone for his life by being hanged by the neck the day he died? No. <laughs> the idea was grotesque. Why should he confess to us? No evidence against him, no evidence in the world against Dorian Gray. Except that, of course. The picture itself with its evil, leering face and its blood-dripping hands, there was the only evidence in the world against him. He would destroy it. He looked round and saw the knife that had killed Basil Hallward. Well, it had killed the painter, so it could kill the painter's work. And everything that meant it would kill his conscience, too. It would kill this monstrous life of his soul. And without the hideous warnings from his soul, he would be free again. So he took up the knife and stabbed the picture with it. And there was a great cry heard, so horrible in its agony that the frightened servants woke and crept one by one from their rooms. They began to talk to each other in low, terrified whispers. Finally, three of the men servants together mounted the great staircase and loudly knocked upon the barred door of the attic. There was no reply. They called aloud, Mr. Dorian! Mr. Dorian! Length, having failed to break down the heavy door, the men climbed onto the roof and dropped to the balcony. The windows yielded easily enough, their bolts were old. But when at last the three men entered the room together, they saw, hanging there on the wall, a splendid full-length portrait of their young master as they had seen him on that very day. In all the wonder of his golden youth and beauty and pride, Lying on the floor was a dead man in evening dressed with a knife in his heart. He was old, withered, wrinkled, and loathsome of visage. It was not until the men had examined the rings on his fingers 
that they recognize who it was. It was about a year after he had written Dorian Gray that Oscar Wilde met Dorian Gray. There was the young man he'd been writing about. Of course, his name was not Dorian Gray. His name was Lord Alfred Douglas, known to his family and his friends as Bozo. But he did bear the most astonishing resemblance in a dozen ways to the hero of Wyatt's novel. Admittedly, there were certain differences, too. Dorian, as we have seen, never did anything really with his strange, sinister light, except simply to be Dorian. But Lord Alfred Douglas was a poet, and a very considerable poet, too. Oddly enough, and as I often think sadly and significantly enough, Oscar Wilde, almost as soon as his famous and fatal friendship with this young man had begun, himself ceased almost altogether to write poetry, hardly another line. All his attention now was on the stage, and as I believe for the first time since his birth on life itself, that tiger life, as he was to call it in later years, and life itself and the stage alike meant to Oscar Wilde, of course, the spirit of beauty, and the spirit of laughter, the spirit of comedy. And so it was that on the 12th of February in the year 1895, we find that Oscar Wilde sent a telegram to one of the dearest and most devoted friends of his whole life, to Mrs. Ada Leverson, the novelist, whom for a mysterious reason of his own he always used to call the Sphinx. And here is the telegram, dear Sphinx. Can you possibly come here to July 745? Dress rehearsal without scenery. Bring Robbie or somebody with you. I've secured a small box for you for opening night, love, Oscar. Now, the opening night in question was to be the opening night of that new comedy of his own, about which he himself felt so secure, so certain, that when, during the rehearsal, some newspaper man asked him did he think it was going to be a success, he had answered, but it is already the, the most enormous. Oh, yes, because the, the, the point is, he said, the question is, will the audience be a success? Of course, by this time, the importance of being Oscar had really come to mean the importance of not being earnest. And I suppose that most of us remember bits and pieces of that indescribably complicated little plot. I have no intention of going into all that, but I would like you to remember that in it, a certain very charming, very cultivated, rather solemn, rather earnest young gentleman. In fact, his name is Mr. Ernest Worthing. And he's in love with the Honorable Gwendolyn Fairfax, to whom he offers honorable marriage. Well, he's caught red-handed, as you might say, by Gwendolyn's mother as he's proposing to Gwendolyn. In comes Gwendolyn's mother, Lady Blackmore. And seeing the young gentleman kneeling at her daughter's feet, she says to him, rise, sir, from this semi-recumbent posture. I have a few questions to put to you, Mr. Worthing, and while I am making these inquiries, you, Gwendolen, may wait for me below in the carriage. The carriage, Gwendolen. Gwendolen, the carriage. You may uh, take a seat, Mr. Worthing, and thank you, Lady Blackmore, for first standing. Well, Mr. Worthing, I'm bound to tell you that you are not down here on my list of eligible young men, though I have the same list as the dear Duchess of Bolton has. We work together, in fact. However, I'm perfectly willing to enter your name should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Well, yes, Lady Blackman, I must admit, I smoke. I'm glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? I'm 29. A very good age to be married at. Mm. I have always been of the opinion that a man desiring to marry should know either everything or nothing. Which do you know? I know nothing, Lady Blackmore. I am pleased to hear it. I do not myself approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. Ignorance, Mr. Worthing, is like a delicate exotic bloom. Touch it, and the bloom has gone. The whole system of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England, at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. If it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes and very probably lead to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. What is your income between seven and 8,000 a year in land or in investments? In investments chiefly, oh, that is, that is accurate. 
Uh, well, between the duties expected of one during one's lifetime and the duties extracted from one after one's death, land has really ceased to be either a profit or a pleasure. It gives one position and prevents one from keeping it up, and that is all that can be said about land. Well, I have a country house, Lady Bracken, with some land, of course, attached to a country house. How many bedrooms? Oh, well, we can all deal with those matters later on. Uh, but you have a townhouse, too, I hope, Mr. Worthy. A girl with a sweet, simple, unspoiled nature like Gwendolen's can hardly be expected to reside in the country. Well, I do own a house in Belgrave Square. Belgrave Square, oh yes, what number, Belgrave Square? 149. Oh. The unfashionable side. I thought there would be something. However, that can always be altered. Do you mean the fashion or the side? Both. If necessary, I presume. Well, your politics. Well, my politics, I'm afraid I haven't got any, really. I'm, uh, I'm a liberal unionist. Oh, they count as Tories. They dine with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or come in sometimes in the evenings after dinner, anyway. Oh, well, well, so far I am satisfied. And now to minor matters. Are your parents living? I'm sorry to say I've lost both my parents, both. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks to me like carelessness. Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy or was he born in what the radical papers call the purple of commerce? Uh, I am afraid that is honestly what I can't you, Lady Bracknell. The fact is, I, I said just now that my parents had lost me. I think it would be more near the truth to say that I seem to have lost my parents. I mean, I don't actually know, you see. I don't know who I am by birth. I was, well, I was found. Found! The late Mr. Thomas Cardew, an old gentleman of extraordinarily kindly and charitable disposition, found me. Yes, and he gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a, a, a first-class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. Worthing is a place in Sussex, Lady Bracknell. It's a, it's a seaside resort. And where did the charitable gentleman with the first-class ticket for this seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag! Yes. Yes, Lady Bracknell, I was... I was in a handbag. <laughs> it was a somewhat large, old-fashioned black leather handbag with handles to it. Perfectly ordinary handbag, in fact. And in what particular locality did this Mr. James or Thomas Cardew come across this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station, the Brighton line. The line is immaterial. Mr. Worthing, I confess I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born, or at any rate bred, in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life which remains one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I presume you know what that unfortunate movement led to. As to the particular locality in which the handbag was discovered, well, you can hardly imagine for one moment that I, or Lord Bracknell, would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom, to form an alliance with a parcel. Good morning, Mr. Worthing. Well, the first night of the important little in earnest, the last person I said, Sphinx, Mrs. Ada Leverton has called it, was on St. Valentine's Day, the 14th of February, 1895, at the Crusade of the Theatre in London. It was, of course, a triumphant success. The author was now at the zenith of his career, aesthetic poet, wit, sage, prophet, student, critic, novelist, dramatist. 
as well as being a very happy husband and the father of two fine boys. Life was radiant at that moment for Oscar Wilde, or appeared to be so. Life was what he had decided it should be, most exquisite and absurd. And the very air in St. James's Theatre on that historical first night was radiant too, it seems, rippling with laughter, scented, warm, although indeed outside the theatre, the London night was very cold. Outside the theatre, too, the Marquis of Queensbury, who for a long time now had been violently and vainly protesting against the intimate friendship of his son, Bosey, Lord Alfred Douglas, with the famous author. The Marquis turned furiously away from the theatre to his drive home. It was a bitter night. He had been prevented by the London police from entering the auditorium, and so he had tried to satisfy his fantastic, fanatical hatred against Oscar Wilde by leaving in his name at the stage door an extraordinary bouquet, composed, I suppose, by himself, not of flowers at all, but of cauliflowers. Oh, cauliflowers. Carrots, onions, turnips, ca cabbages, parsnips, and other well-known ho wholesome household vegetables. And this vegetable bouquet, his lordship had proposed to hurl with suitable epithets at the head of his hated enemy, Oscar Wilde, well, having failed about the bouquet, the Marquis, the screaming scarlet Marquis, Wilde used to call him, left a few days later an open card in the hands of the porter of the Albemarle Club, of which Wilde was a member. And on this open card, his lordship had scribbled a few violent and incidentally ill-spelt words, libelous in character. And when again, a few days later, Oscar Wilde himself calling his club, read what the Marquis had written on this open card. He wrote a brief letter, not to Lord Alfred Douglas, but to a friend who has not entered into our talk tonight at all. He was the most devoted, loyal, true, loving, unselfish, and courageous friend that Wilde ever had. His name was Robert Ross, and this is what Wilde wrote to him. My dearest Robbie, since I saw you today, something has happened. Bose's father has left an open card at my club with hideous words on it. I, I can't see anything now but a criminal prosecution because my whole life seems to be ruined by this man. The Tower of Ivory is assailed by the foul thing. On the sand is my life spent. Robbie, I don't know if you possibly can come here at about 11.30 tonight, I beg you to. I know that I mar your life by trespassing on your love and your kindness. I have asked Bosey to come here tomorrow. Try to do it tonight. Yours ever. Oscar Wilde and Alfred Taylor. The crime of which you have been convicted is so bad that one has to put stern restraint upon oneself to prevent oneself from describing, in language which I would rather not use, the sentiments which must rise to the breast of every man of honor who has heard the details of these terrible trials. It is no use for me to address you. People who can do these things must be dead to all sense of shame and one cannot hope to produce any effect on them. It is the worst case that I have ever tried, that you, Wilde, have been the center of a circle of extensive corruption of the most hideous kind amongst young men it is impossible to doubt. I shall, under the circumstances, be expected to pass the severest sentence that the law of England allows. In my judgment, it is wholly inadequate in such a case as yours. The sentence of the court is that each of you be imprisoned 
and put to hard labor for two years. There was a brief silence with some odd cries of shame, shame. And suddenly Oscar Wilde cried out and I, may I say nothing, my lord? Mr. Justice Wills in reply flapped an impatient hand at the warders who hurried the two prisoners, the poet and the pimp, out of sight. Out of sight and out of mind and outside the old bailey on the paving stones of Fleet Street, London, prosperous citizens and public prostitutes danced together in virtuous triumph. The 90s of the Green Carnation were dead and done for forever. The mood of the Yellow Book was destined to make way for the reign of the Yellow Press. And yet, yet one cannot help wondering if Oscar Wilde had been allowed to speak at that moment, what would have happened? Would he possibly have delivered a speech comparable to the speech of Robert Emmett from the dock? A speech that quite independently of his own fate might have revealed to the world the strange and uniquely Anglo-Saxon attitude of the law that had condemned him. It's impossible, of course, for us to know. Only one thing seems quite certain. We all feel, I think, that it is time today not to forget the shame or the scandal that surrounded Oscar Wilde's name, but to now, to place them in their correct relationship with his subsequent development as an artist and as a human soul. The indescribable mental anguish he endured at this period of his life was bound, of course, to find some expression sooner or later. And it did, as we know, in a letter he wrote from his prison cell to his friend Bosey. Lord Alfred Douglas, the forgetful friend who had never once visited Wilde or even written a letter to him for two long and bitter prison years. And when Wilde's letter was finished, his own bosom was cleansed, as he himself said, of much perilous matter, a great deal of perilous matter. And the letter, which still exists and is world famous, is known to us now as De Profundis. Her Majesty's Prison Reading, dear Bosey, after long and fruitless waiting, I've determined to write to you myself as much for your sake as for mine as I would not like to think that I'd passed through two long years of imprisonment without ever having received a single line from you, or any news or any message even, except such as gave me pain. Our ill-fated and most lamentable friendship has ended in this ruin and public infamy for me, and yet, yet the memory of our ancient affection for each other is still very often with me, and the thought that Loathing and bitterness and contempt should forever take the place in my heart that was once held by love is very sad to me. And I have no doubt at all, Bosey, that in this letter that I must write of your life and of mine, there may be much that will wound your vanity to the quick well, if it proves so. Read the letter over and over again until it's killed your vanity. And do not be afraid to read it. Remember this. The supreme vice is shallowness. Everything that is realized is right. And I will begin, Bosey, by telling you that I do blame myself terribly, yes, as I sit here in this dark cell in prison clothes, a disgraced and ruined man. I blame myself. I blame myself for having allowed an unintellectual friendship, a friendship whose primary aim was not the creation or the contemplation of beautiful things entirely to dominate my life. From the very beginning, there was far too wide a gulf between you and me. And at the appalling result of my friendship with you, I will not speak at present. I'm thinking now merely of its quality while it lasted. Frankly, it was intellectually degrading to me. Degrading. Those violent, incessant scenes which seemed almost physically necessary to you and during which your mind and your body grew into something that was as terrible to look at as to listen to. That other dreadful mania you inherited from your father, the mania for re writing revolting and loathsome letters and postcards, your complete lack of any control over your emotions, these were the origin and the cause of my fatal yielding to you and your increasing daily demands. You, you wore me out. 
In the letter I received from you on the very morning of the day that I allowed you to drag me down to the police station to apply for that ridiculous warrant for your father's arrest. Oh, that was the worst you ever wrote in your life, and for the most shameful reasons. You and your father. Oh, between you both, I do admit I'd lost my head. My judgment forsook me. Sheer terror took its place. Blindly, I staggered as an ox to the shambles, and those of my friends who really did desire my welfare implored me to retire abroad, not to stay in England to face an obviously impossible trial. It was you who forced me to stay. It was you who forced me into the witness box to brazen it all out there, if possible, with absurd and silly perjuries and lies, when of course at the end I was arrested, of course I was. And your father became the hero of the hour. His place today is with the kind, pure-minded parents of Sunday school literature. Your place is with the infant Samuel. And in the lowest mire of Malibolge, I sit between Gilles de Ray and the Marquis de Sade. Oh, of course, I, I recognize in all our relations not destiny merely, but doom. Doom, who walks always swiftly because she goes to the shedding of blood. I remember you sending me a very nice poem of the undergraduate school of verse for my approval, and I reply with a letter of fantastic literary conceits. I compare you to Hylas, to Hyacinth, to John Quill, to Narcissus, to some young man whom the god of poetry favored and honored with his love. My letter to you was like a passage from one of Shakespeare's sonnets transposed to a minor key. Bosey, look at the history of that letter. It passes from you into the hands of one of your loathsome companions of the streets, from him to a gang of blackmailers. Copies of it are sent all over London to my friends and to the manager of the theater where my work is being performed. Every construction but the right one is put upon it. Society is thrilled with the absurd rumor that I've had to pay a huge sum of money for having written an infamous letter to you, and this forms the basis of your father's first attack on me. I produced the original letter myself in the open court to show what it really is. It is denounced by your father's counsel as being a loathsome and insidious attempt to corrupt your innocence. Your Ultimately, it forms part of a criminal charge against me. The Crown takes it up. The judge sums up on it with little learning and much morality. I go to prison for it at last. And that is the result of writing you a charming letter. Some newspaper, oh, the Pall Mall Gazette, I think it was, describing a dress rehearsal of one of my plays, spoke of you as following me everywhere like my shadow. Well, the memory of our friendship is the shadow that walks with me here. It seems indeed never, never to leave me. It wakes me up at night to tell me the same story. The same story on over and over again. In the morning, it follows me out to the prison yard. It makes me talk to myself as I tramp round and round. Each detail that accompanied each dreadful moment, I am forced to recall there is nothing, nothing that happened in those ill-starred years with you that I cannot recreate in that chamber of the brain that is set apart for grief or for despair. Every strained note of your voice, every twitch and gesture of your nervous hands, every bitter word, every poisonous phrase comes back to me, and I have to remember the street or the river down which we passed, the wall or woodland that surrounded us. At what figure on the dial stood the hands of the clock? Which way went the wings of the wind, the shape and the color of the moon? You and I have known each other now for four years, four years. For the first half of that time, we were always together. The second half of that time, I have had to spend alone in prison as a result of my friendship with you. And how clearly I saw it all then, as God knows. I see it now, and I cannot tell you that. But I did say to myself, I love him. 
And at all costs, I must keep love in my heart, because if I go into prison without love, what will become of my soul? And those letters I sent you at that time from Holloway, they were part of my endeavor to preserve that love as the dominant motive of my own nature. My God, I could, had I chosen, have torn you to pieces with bitter reproaches. I could have rent you with maledictions. I could have held up a mirror to you and shown you such an image of yourself that you would never have recognized it as your own until you saw it, mimicking back your gestures of horror. And then you would have known whose shape it was. And then you would have hated it and hated yourself forever. <laughs> forever. Forever. Yes. More than that and worse than that. Worse, as you know only too well. The sins. No, no, let me say simply the sins of another. You will understand. The sins of another were being placed to my account. Had I chosen, I could on either trial have saved myself at the expense of that other. Oh, not from shame indeed, but certainly from imprisonment. Oh, yes, had I cared to show that the Crown witnesses, those three most important witnesses, have been most carefully coached by your father and by his solicitors, and not in reticences merely, but in lying assertions, in the absolute transference, deliberate, plotted, and rehearsed, of the actions and the doings of that other unto me. Had I done that, I could have walked out of that court with my tongue in my cheek and my hands in my pockets a free man. I didn't choose to do it. And never for one single moment have I, I regretted that decision of mine. Never, no, I swear it. Not even at the most bitter hour of my whole terrible imprisonment. But, Bosey, do you really think that you were worthy of the love that I was showing you then? Or that for one single moment I thought that you were worthy? Sorrow after sorrow has come beating on these prison doors in search of me. They've opened the gates wide. They've let them all in. Hardly, if at all, have my friends been allowed to see me here. My enemies, oh, oh they, they've been allowed free access all the time. Harsh and violent and bitter letters have arrived to me lately from my wife's solicitors. I am at once taunted and threatened with complete poverty. Oh, that. I could endure that. I could steel myself now to face worse things than poverty, but now, now you see my, my two children, my two little sons are taken away from me by legal procedure. And that any law could decide or could take upon itself to decide that I am a man unfit to be with my own children never to see them again, never. Something so unutterably terrible. Terrible, oh, the pain and the disgrace of prison are nothing compared to that, nothing at all. I envy those wretched men who tramp round the prison yard along with me. I envy them because I know that their children wait for them look forward to their homecoming and will be sweet to them, whatever they've done, whatever they've done. Because the poor are kinder, you see, they're kinder, wiser, more sympathetic and infinitely more sensitive than we are. In their eyes, prison is simply a tragedy in a man's life. It's something that calls for sympathy from others. The poor speak of a man who is in prison as of one who is in trouble, simply. Did you know that? In trouble. That is the word they always use, and the phrase has the perfect wisdom of love in it. But everything about my personal tragedy has been so hideous, so mean, repellent, and lacking in style. Boy, our very dress makes us grotesque. We are the zanies of sorrow. We are 
clowns whose hearts are broken, we seem indeed specially designed to appeal to the sense of humor. On the 13th of November, 1895, I was brought here from London to Reading. And from two o'clock until half past two on that day, I was made to stand on the central platform of Clapham Junction in convict clothes and handcuffed for the whole world to look at. I had been taken out of the prison infirmary ball without one moment's notice being given to me. I was still feverish and very weak, and so, of course, of all possible objects I was, I know, the most grotesque. And when the people saw me standing there, they laughed. train as it came up, swelled that audience. They, they laughed. Nothing could exceed their amusement, and that, of course, was before they realized who I was. When they had been officially informed who I was, they laughed. Only a half an hour it was, I stood there in the gray November rain, surrounded by a jeering mob, and for a whole year after that had been done to me, I wept. I wept every day at that same hour and for precisely that same length of time. Now remember, this is not really quite as tragic as it may sound to you, because you see, to us, I mean, to us men who lie in prison in, in such bitter disgrace as mine. Well, tears are simply a part of each day's experience. Indeed, I may tell you that a day in prison on which a man does not weep is a day on which his heart is hard. Not a day on which his heart is happy. The real evil of prison is not that it can break one's heart. I've discovered that doesn't matter at all, but that it may turn one's heart into a stone. I remember, too, sitting in the dock on the occasion of my third and last trial and listening to Frank Lockwood's appalling denunciation of me. It was appalling like something out of Tacitus, like something out of Dante, like Savonarola's indictment of the popes of Rome. And I remember being sickened and shaken with terror at what I heard. Quite suddenly, it did come down to me. It came. The thought, I thought, how splendid it would be if I was saying all these things about myself. Yes, because I realized at that moment, you see, that what is said about a man means nothing at all. The point is, who said it? Who? Man's very highest moment, I have no doubt at all, though, is when he kneels down in the dust and beats his breast and tells all the sins of his life. And so with you, Bosie. So with you, I swear it. You would be much happier if you could let your mother know a little, at any rate, of your life. Now, you must not be afraid to tell her no. And you must not allow some sentimental absurdity to prevent your telling her. Remember this, that the sentimentalist is invariably a cynic at heart. Indeed, sentimentality is simply the bank holiday of cynicism. And delightful as cynicism may be from its intellectual side in itself, it can never be more than the perfect philosophy for the man without a soul. Because, do you see, to the mere cynic, nothing is ever revealed. Of course, I do know that to one as modern as I am, enfant de mon siècle, merely to look at this world will be always so lovely. I tremble with pleasure when I think that on the very day of my being released from prison, both the laburnum and the lilac will be blooming in the gardens. And I will be free again to see the wind stir into restless beauty the swaying gold of the one 
and make the other toss the pale purple of its plume so that all the air shall be a radio for me. But all trials are trials for one's life, just as all sentences are sentences of death. And three times have I been tried so that society as we have constituted society will have no place for me can never indeed again have any place to offer me. I know that. I know that. I know that. I seem indeed to have stepped from one moment of fame to an eternity of infamy. And I yet have to learn and realize that until the day I die, I shall be an outcast. But nature, whose sweet rains fall on unjust and just alike, will have clefts among the rocks where I may hide, and secret valleys in whose silence I may weep undisturbed. And imperfect and utterly incomplete as I know I am, yet from me you may still have much to gain. You came to me once long ago, do you remember, to learn from me the pleasure of art and the pleasure of life, or work. Now it may be that I am chosen to teach you something so much more wonderful, the meaning of sorrow and its beauty. Your affectionate friend, Oscar Wilde. And yet, you know, yet, there were moments, even in the blackest hours of his prison life, in which the old, incurably blithe spirit of his humor came dancing and prancing forth once more. One of his warders, it seems, had a great taste for reading, a very kindly fellow, a Belfast man, I think, uh, who had what is known as a literary bent. Poor Walter Martin, that's what he had. And anyway, he was very kind to Wilde, and one day in a conversation with his distinguished prisoner, Warder Martin, it seems, said, excuse me, Mr. Wilde, excuse me, but uh, on the subject of uh, literature and culture in general, Mr. Wilde, as we have been, uh, would you tell me, please, what you think about Charles Dickens? What I'd like to know, Mr. Wilde, is would Charles Dickens be considered as one of the world's really great writers, would he? Charles Dickens? But of course he would, you see, he's dead. Oh, eh? I haven't thought about that. He's great and dead like William Shakespeare, huh? Yeah, I see what you mean, Mr. Wilde. Now, excuse me talking so much today, sir, but uh, on the same subject, like what about the great novelist John Strange Winter? The novelist of the century, as he was referred to in my Sunday paper last Sunday. The novelist, oh, he must be making thousands of pounds, mind you. And what I'd like to know is would uh, your opinion of John Strange Winter, like one great writer talking about another great writer, what would your own opinion be of the works of Mr. John Strange Winter, sir? What would my opinion be of the works of John Strange Winter? Well, dear Martin, dear friend, as you are such a passionate admirer of that most popular novelist, I'm sure it will fascinate you to learn that in reality, Mr. John Strange Winter is a lady. Oh, yes. I assure you it's true. You didn't know? Yes, a lady, and I believe a most fascinating and charming lady, who, in fact, from everything I hear, I feel quite convinced that I'd much rather spend my time talking to her than reading him. A lady? Well, you'll live and learn. That's all I can say, Mr. Wilde. You mean to tell me in point of fact that uh, Master John Strange went her as a female, is he? <gasps> my God. I know what this century is coming to, sir. Good thing it's nearly over, if you ask me. Well, no, there. Lady novelist. Oh, that reminds me now. I, I, excuse me for detaining you, I'm sure, Mr. Wilde. But uh, on the subject of lady novelist, like, sir, would, uh, what would your opinion be about Marie Corrali? Marie Corrali, I have all her books at home, you know. I have them all read four or five times. And she's called the Queen of Passion. The Queen of Passion is what she's known universally. And uh, what I'd like to know, sir, as would uh, Marie Corrali be ranked among the great lady writers of the world, same say as the Sisters Brunt? There was a delicate pause, and then why I said very gravely, now remember, dear friend, dear Martin, I am not referring 
in any manner to the private moral life of Miss Marie Corella. I am making no criticism at all, but frankly, from the way she writes, she ought to be here instead of me. Oscar Wilde was released from prison on May the 19th, 1897, and among the friends who gathered to welcome him in the house of the reverend and indeed the heroic Stuart Headlam was Wilde's old friend, the Sphinx, Mrs. Leverson. Mrs. Ada Leverson, there she was, the glorious Sphinx. The only lady present, and of course it's she who was left behind, far the most vivid account of this re reunion. We all felt acutely embarrassed, she confesses, at the idea of seeing poor Oscar again. But the moment Oscar himself came into the room, he put us all at his ease, because he came in with all the grace and dignity of a king returning from exile. He came in talking, laughing, smoking a cigarette with freshly waved hair and a flower in his buttonhole, and his first words to me were sphinx. Ah, oh, my dear Sphinx. Sphinxes are minions of the moon, and you rise at dawn to greet them. And my dear Sphinx, he continued, how brilliantly clever of you to know exactly the right sort of hat to wear at seven o'clock in the morning to welcome an old friend who has been away. He said, my dear, you can't have sat up. You must have got up. Well. He went on talking in his light and usually trivial vein for a while, and then he sat down and wrote a very brief note and sent it off by cab to a Catholic retreat nearby, begging permission to be allowed to enter there and rest and meditate and read and so on for about six months. While waiting for a reply, he lounged in a corner of the sofa in quite his old grand, bland manner, smoking one cigarette after another, telling one fantastic story after another, and among many other things he said to the Sphinx, Sphinx, do you know one of the really dreadful punishments that happen to poor prisoners when they're away? It's so brutal, I hardly like to tell you, my dear. So cruel. They're not allowed to read the Daily Chronicle. Did you know that? Did you? No, they're not. Coming along on the train, I beg to be allowed to read it myself. No, 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 out of the question. I then suggested very humbly, of course, that it might be permissible, perhaps, for me to read it upside down. To this, to my enormous astonishment, they consented. And so, dear Sphinx, all the way from Reading to London, I read the Daily Chronicle upside down, and I've never enjoyed it so much in all my life before. It really is the only way to read a newspaper. Well, presently, Mrs. Leverson continues, the cabman returned with the message, the long-awaited answer. But it was bad news, apparently, the Catholic retreat replying that they could not dream of accepting Oscar Wilde under their roof on what they termed his mere impulse of a passing moment. He must think about the question very seriously indeed, they informed him, for at least a year. In fact, like everybody else, they, they turned their back on him. And when he read this and realized perhaps the sort of life that lay before him, he broke down completely and wept. Mrs. Leverson tells us these are her own words again now. Poor Oscar wept with all the bitter abandon of a child. I learned later, she goes on to say, that he left for France that same afternoon, accompanied, of course, by the faithful Robert Ross and by another very good friend, Reginald Turner. He never set foot in England or indeed in his own Ireland again. But later on, in that same year, in 1897, the great French writer, André Gide, who had known Wilde intimately for many, many years, called on him and found him living in a small house he had taken for the summer on the outskirts of a very remote and rather desolate little French fishing village called bernval sur mer And here, she tells us, he found the Irish poet in a subdued but mysteriously happy frame of mind, filled with a sort of romantic devotion to the little fishing village of Bernval, and filled, too, with the most extraordinary determination to live there for the rest of his life, never to leave it for a single day. Now I know I shall never go away from Bernval again, and I never want to, aren't they? He cried enthusiastically. You see, the thought of Paris and London and places like that terrifies me now. Prison has completely changed my imagination, you know. I was relying on it to do that, he added. Oh, yes, I could never go back to my old way of living. Beautiful as it was, I could never go back. Hmm? Well, for one thing, André, you must never forget that my life is a work of art. And no artist should ever resume his labors on the same work of art in the same manner twice. 
or it may point to the fact that the first attempt was not a complete success. And then again, I've learned something in prison. Oh, nothing they wanted to teach me, I'm afraid, but I believe I've learned something. Something about pity. Isn't that extraordinary? Pity. Because in my great London days, you know, the idea of pity never entered my head, never. But now, the mere existence of pity in this cold and terrible world seems to me a thing of such infinite and flame-like beauty that I thank God, and I mean that sincerely and literally, aren't I? I thank God on my knees every night and every morning for having taught me something of the meaning of pity. Even if I had to go into prison to learn it, it was well worthwhile, well worthwhile. Now, do you want to give me an enormous pleasure? Please, when you get back to Paris, will you send me a, a very beautiful and complete life of Francis? Well, of course, Francis of Assisi. Saint Francis of Assisi, yes, because you see, I feel that the road that Francis discovered may be the road that I am meant to try to follow if I can. Who knows, he ended, I might do worse things with the rest of my life. Now, Oscar Wilde, as we can guess, never even posed as being a particularly consistent sort of man. Consistency, indeed, far from being a virtue he admired, was once, they say, included in a little list he made of what he himself called the seven deadly virtues. However, I personally believe myself that his mystical, lonely St. Francis period at Bernville, shall we call it his Franciscan epoch, by the waves, was completely sincere and genuine as long as it lasted. The only trouble was it didn't last very long. Any more than his romantic devotion to the little village of Bernville, where he was going to spend the rest of his life, lasted very long. I shall go mad, Robbie. Stark, staring, raving mad, if you or Reggie Turner or any other human creature endeavors to keep me for one day or night longer in this ghastly little hole, he was saying a little while later about Bernville, it is killing me, Robbie. Always a favorite phrase of Wyatt. Killing me, killing me with boredom. And even his righteous indignation against Bosey, Lord Alfred Douglas, didn't last. And we've seen something of the violent and bitter sincerity of that from those few pages of De, De Profundis, but it didn't last because he went back to him. You know, he went back to him fatally, of course, as it turned out, but he did go back to him. Rejoining him in Italy in the autumn of 1897, at Posilipo in Naples, where Lord Alfred had a villa by the sea, and it was in that very house, the Villa Giudice, that Oscar Wilde completed the great poem that was to prove his last work of literature in this world. He'd gone back now, do you see, to writing poetry. And now it was a very different, a new sort of poetry for Oscar Wilde, so simple that it might have seemed to form a part of some Irish country ballad and imbued with that sense of pity that he told André Gide he learned in jail. And he dedicated this poem, not to any of his intimate friends at all, but to an unknown English soldier. Now, I say unknown because although the two men were in the same jail at the same time, it is a definite fact that they never addressed a single word to each other. But the English soldier was hanged for the murder of his own wife on the morning of July the 7th, 1896, and Oscar Wilde, watching the man's anguish day by day, and even on the terrible morning of the execution, was filled with that curious pity he'd always felt for the guilty, more than for the innocent, because he believed that the guilty suffered much more than the innocent suffered. To this unhappy man, then, Wilde dedicated the poem that he calls The Ballad of Reading Jail. He did not wear his scarlet coat, for blood and wine are red, and blood and wine were on his hands when they found him with the dead, the poor dead woman he had loved and murdered in her bed. He walked among the trial men in a suit of shabby gray, a cricket cap was on his head, and his step seemed light and gay. But I never saw a man who looked so wistfully at the day. 
I never saw a man who looked with such a wistful eye upon that little tent of blue that prisoners call the sky and at every drifting cloud that went with sails of silver by. I walked with other souls in pain within another ring and was wondering if the man had done a great or little thing when a voice behind me whispered low, that fella's got to swing. Dear Christ, the very prison walls suddenly seemed to reel and the sky above my head became like a cask of scorching steel. And though I was a soul in pain, my pain I could not feel. I only knew what hunted thought quickened his step and why he looked upon the garish day with such a wistful eye. The man had killed the thing he loved, and so he had to die. Yet each man kills the thing he loves. By all, let this be heard. Some do it with a bitter look, some with a flattering word. The coward does it with a kiss, the brave man with a sword. So the days and nights and weeks crawled by, as the poet prisoner has described, on feet of lead. And at last, the dreadful day of execution dawned. The murderer was hanged and buried. And the poet, dreaming over his last terrible resting place, sees that where his grave had opened wide, there was no grave at all. Only a stretch of mud and sand by that hideous prison wall and a little heap of burning lime. But the man should have his pall, for he has a pall. This wretched man, such as few men may claim, deep down below a prison yard, Naked for greater shame, he lies with fetters on each foot, wrapped in a sheet of flame, and all the while the burning lime eats flesh and bone away. It eats the brittle bone by night and the soft flesh by day. It eats the flesh and bone by turn, but it eats the heart always. For three long years, they will not sow, nor root, nor seedling there. For three long years, his unblessed grave must sterile be and bear and look upon the wandering sky with unreproachful stare. They think a murderer's heart would taint each simple seed they sow. It is not true. God's kindly earth is kindlier than men know, and the red rose will but blow more red, the white rose whiter blow. Out of his mouth a red, red rose, out of his heart a white. For who can say by what strange way Christ brings his will to light, since the barren staff the pilgrim bore bloomed in the great Pope's sight. But they hanged him as a beast is hanged. They did not even toll a requiem, which might have brought rest to his startled soul. But hurriedly they took him out and hid him in a hole. The chaplain would not kneel to pray by his dishonored grave, nor mark it with that blessed cross that Christ for sinners gave, because the man was one of those whom Christ came down to save. <gasps> Happy they whose hearts can break when peace and pardon win. How else may man make straight his plan and cleanse his soul from sin? How else but through a broken heart may Lord Christ enter in? In Reading Jail by Reading Town there is a pit of shame, and in it lies a wretched man eaten by teeth of flame. In a burning winding sheet he lies, and his grave has got no name. And there, till Christ call forth the dead, in silence let him lie. No need to waste the foolish tear, nor heave the windy sigh. The man had killed the thing he loved, and so he had to die. And all men kill the thing they love. By all let this be heard. 
Some do it with a bitter look, some with a flattering word. The coward does it with a kiss, the brave man with a sword. What more is there to say about him, except that after he had finished the Ballad of Reading Jail, he and Lord Douglas, Alfred Douglas both found that their friendship was not to endure for much longer. It continually broke and was remade, and this time it broke again. And for a long while, Oscar Wilde roved about in Europe, mostly in Italy, mostly alone, a derelict in the prime of life. His wife, Constance, died suddenly at Genoa. Stricken when he heard the news of her illness with grief and remorse, he hastened to journey to her side, but he was too late even to say goodbye to her. He covered her grave with red roses, and he drifted south again, south, always south, to Rome, to Naples, on as far as Sicily, but, but Paris, of course, was to be the ultimate and inevitable destination for him, Paris, with her great beauty. Her time-worn airs and graces, her often grim and invariably knowledgeable and experienced smile, and her secret gift of infinite compassion. He wrote no more. Like Socrates, he talked, oh, not as wisely, but as well. And although death was so much closer than he realized at the time, he did live on for a few months more in Paris in a small hotel whose proprietors, Monsieur and Madame du Poirier, evinced for him the most tender, touching, poetical, and practical kindness and friendship. They were goodness and sweetness itself from this very ordinary French bourgeois couple. And I often think of how harshly, how unimaginatively they've been treated by so many of Wilde's biographers, not all of them, but so many of whom have insisted and still go on insisting upon the wretched, sordid, tumble-down, squalid, cheap sort of place in which the Irish poet died. Now, you know, in point of fact, the Hotel d'Alsace in the Rue des Beaux-Arts in the Latin Quarter of Paris is still there, by the way. You can see it any day in the French capital. It, it was the first place in the world to honor the still deeply dishonored man by boldly placing on its outer wall a few months after his death a plaque informing the passerby that here it was that the great Dublin dramatist and poet died. And in this little unpretentious but by no means unattractive hotel, Wilde was established by his good Parisian friends in the two best rooms in the establishment, and he would have been more than comfortable there, and might even conceivably have found some sort of happiness too, but, but for one absurdly trivial sort of detail, or seemingly trivial, that barred all happiness away from him as long as he remained within those four walls, and that was indeed the wallpaper. The wallpaper, now imagine that. However, the wallpaper, it seems, especially for such a a passionate lover of visual beauty as he, the wallpaper was tough. I have it on extremely good authority that it was more than tough. It was diabolically and deliberately ugly in design and carried out, it seems, by some wicked person in three shades, hues, or tints, magenta and magenta and magenta. And every time poor Wilde looked at it, which had to be pretty often, you see, because he was so much there, he would give vent to his favorite old slogan and say, it's killing me, Robbie. The wallpaper, the wallpaper is killing me, killing me. Well, one day, as though he suddenly realized, perhaps he did indeed, that death had come close. Because he looked for a long while at the offending wallpaper, and then he smiled and said, yes, of course. One of us had to go. But I don't think it was the wallpaper that was killing him by inches, but something was, and I feel certain that it was the memory of his marvelous and so tragically ruined career, strange. That I was not told that the brain could hold in one tiny ivory cell God's heaven and hell. Was it prophetic, the last verse of that very early love poem to Lily Langtry and how far away she must seem from now, the glorious, the notorious Jersey Lily and how far away, indeed, all the radiant images of his youth, so far away from this lonely, tragic man, dying, penniless, at the age of 45. That's all he was. He had just turned 46 when he died. 
And even so, with all his misfortunes, at the end his brain was burning, his imagination seemed on fire, the magical talk still flowed from him in that unpremeditated and apparently perfect prose that so astonished his listeners when they heard him, especially the great writers of the period who admired his style. And one evening, it was his last outing. He was sitting with those few friends of his who remained to him and were not ashamed to be seen with him in public. And with them, he sat one night outside the a little cafe on the Boulevard des Italiens, when suddenly he remembered a tiny fable he had made in his grand London days. And for no apparent reason at all, he told it again. Night fell over a purple city, he began, and the Son of God was alone. And there, in a street of that city, he beheld a woman whose face and raiment were painted and whose feet were shod with pearl. And behind the woman, Following her as slowly as a hunter, there came a young man whose eyes were bright with lust. And he laid his hand upon the young man's shoulder, and he said to him, Why do you look on this woman in this wise? And the young man turned and recognized him. And he made answer and said, I was blind, and you, you gave me my sight. And on what else should I look? And he moved swiftly forward and touched the painted raiment of the woman. And he said to her, is there no way for you to walk save in this way of sin? And the woman turned and recognized him. And she laughed with joy. And she said, but you forgave me my sins. And the way is a pleasant way. And very slowly he moved forth from that city. And when he had wandered through the gateway of the city, he saw seated by the roadside a man who was weeping. And he went towards him, and he laid his hand upon the man's head, and he said, Why are you weeping? And the man looked up and recognized him. And he made answer and said, Lord, I was dead, and you raised me from the dead. What can I do now but weep? The poet's last days in Paris, like that little story, was sad and strange enough indeed. Physically, he suffered very greatly, often thrusting his hand into his mouth to prevent himself from crying aloud with pain. It is a source of infinite comfort and happiness to many people to know that towards the end, the faithful Robert Ross sent for a priest who baptized the Protestant-born Irishman Oscar Wilde into the Catholic Church, received him, and at the end gave him extreme unction. He died peacefully. And slowly, very slowly after his death, his name, which for so long had been silent in the world of men, or was spoken there only in shameful or in bawdy whispers, began through the gradual appearance of his book. His fairy tales for children, his marvelous essays, his poems, and his plays to sound once more like a bell in the world of art and literature. And to the very end of his life, the man retained not a little, but a great deal of all the old, willful, incorrigible, indeed incurable wit and gaiety and humor of his temperament. In fact, on the morning of the day he died, he beckoned. Robert Ross to his bedside. And in a very weak whisper, he said, Robbie, Robbie, please. Robbie, when the last trumpet sounds and you and I are couched in our purple and porphyry tombs, I shall lean over towards you and whisper, the last. Robbie, I shall add, Robbie, dear boy, pray let us pretend we do not hear it.